Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It's the 4th of September, 2012, and our special guest is Ron Walk, author of Wasting Minds, Why Our Education System is Failing and What We Can Do About It. Ron, thanks so much for being here. I'm delighted. Really appreciate your taking the time. Loved the book. Can't wait to talk to you about it. The Future of Education is a Web 2.0 Labs project. Thanks to Mighty Bell and Blackboard Collaborate for support. We have finished the Learning 2.0 conference. If you missed it, it was all free and it's all recorded at learning20.com. An incredible amount of terrific information there. Great sessions, great keynotes. As well, Connected Educator Month finished as August finished. That's connecteducatormonth.org. And those recordings, as I, I believe, are going up, are up or are going up shortly. Coming up in October from the 3rd to the 5th is our Future of Libraries conference. Uh, that, again, is free. It should have about 150 sessions. It's a terrific event uh, sponsored by San Jose State University's uh, School of Library and Information Sciences. Uh, we are still accepting proposals for presenters, so please feel free to go to library2012.com and let us know if you're interested. And again, you can go to that same site to attend, and it is free. And then our great global education conference, five days, 24 hours a day, November 12th to 16th. Uh, don't miss that. Globaleducationconference.com. Lots and lots of fun, typically several hundred sessions. Uh, Hard, hard not to enjoy that one. Coming up on Thursday, Angie McAllister from the University of Phoenix is going to talk to us about educational social networks, learning analytics, and learning how to learn. There may be some suspicion of University of Phoenix, but I've talked to Angie, and the things she has to say are really quite brilliant. So I can't wait to have her on the show. Pat Ferenga next week on John Holt and homeschooling. Um, Plenty of other good sessions there you're, you're seeing on the screen. New to the list is A True History of the MOOC with Dave Cormier, Alec Coro, Stephen Downs, Rita Kopp, George Siemens, Inga DeWard, and Carol Yeager. That is going to be fun. Anyway, if you've been wondering what MOOCs are about and where they were really invented and, and why the Stanford, Berkeley, MIT, Harvard MOOCs are something different than they started, please tune in for that. Um, also, uh, I think new on this list is Susie Boss on the 23rd. Anyway, lots there, hopefully a session that you'll be interested in. If you've missed any sessions, they are all recorded, full Blackboard, Collaborate, and MP3 formats. Last week we heard from um, Michael Strong on Socratic practice. Really love that conversation. He and I are actually going to record another hour of conversation as a follow-up. We probably won't be doing it publicly, but I will post it at futureofeducation.com. Just looking at the connection between the kind of deep thinking that takes place in a Socratic uh, practice environment and the um, sort of intriguing lack of that deep thinking in our public dialogue. Tony Wagner from Harvard talked to us about um, students as innovators. That was just a ton of fun and lots else there. If you missed the Sugana Mitra talk, really, just you just have to watch it. Thanks for being here. So this is when you get to tell us where you're participating from. Look for the star to the left of the map. Click on it twice, then click on the map, and you can do a shout out in the chat. So Ron is on by telephone, so he's not seeing this, but I will let him know. I, I, I'm, what am I not seeing? I have the screen up. I'm seeing the map. Oh, Let's that's delightful. On it. Terrific. Yeah, I can yeah. see it. That's great, because then you'll be able to see the chat. I'm delighted that's the case. Right. Well, we look to be a North America-centric crowd tonight. And I'm not seeing any notes in the chat of where you're from, but the, the, I'm in Park City, Utah right now, and we're in sunny but windy weather. Here they come. There they come. Massachusetts, Georgia, Arizona. This is a rare day when we don't have international guests, but maybe this is a U.S.-centric kind of a discussion. Meeting with Michelle Obama. Oh, of course. I didn't think of that. Yes, that would have an impact, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think so. If you have any Democrats out there. 
we're going to talk about that. We are going to talk about that. Anyway, no matter where you're participating from or if you're listening to the recording, we're sure glad to have you being a part of this. Uh, I do consulting work for Mighty Bell, which is the new startup by Gina Bianchini who did Ning. Again, no, knowing that I am getting paid by her, you have to take this with a grain of salt, but I love this program. I'm going to put a link in the chat here. It's a space where you can put in links and have a conversation about tonight's show. So that link is there, and it is at Mighty Bell. So, Ron, I, I, I'm, I'm not exaggerating to tell you that um, I read a lot of books every year, and Wasting Minds not only kept me captivated, but it required me to outline uh, in some detail uh, my own sense of the argument because I felt like it was so compelling. The book's been out about a year. Has it gotten the reception that you had hoped for? Uh, well, no, of course. I wanted it to be on the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, but when they published it, they said uh, the title is too negative. You know, the audience of educators doesn't want to hear what a bad job they're doing. And I said, but that's an act apt description of what the book is about, so let's stay with it. And they said, well, okay, but you're not going to sell many. And they were right. But I, but I, I think it's probably sold a couple thousand. Well, in some small way, I hope we make a difference there. But my guess is that we can't produce numbers close enough to getting it on the New York Times bestseller list. Um, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about the sort of core ideas of the book. But uh, I'm going to let you... Um, as we get toward the section on solutions, I'm going to let you kind of decide if you're comfortable with me focusing uh, a fair amount on the solution piece. And the reason I'd like to do so is that this crowd here is typically the choir. And a lot of the points that you make in the book, I think they're going to be right. in agreement with. But um, some of the discussion of how you go about change is, is sort of so compellingly interesting that it may, um, it may uh, be worth a little bit of a deeper dive there. Um, I'd like, if it's yeah. okay with you, I would like to tell you the message I got from the book, and then you can tell me if I got it wrong or, or where you would want to add some nuance. So first, our education system isn't producing the results we want for our society or for our students. Our often deeply held and publicly proclaimed assumptions or narratives about education are flawed or invalid and actually are counterproductive. That those who are thinking carefully about education know that there are better ways or solutions, solutions that may even be critical to our democracy. But the entrenched personal interests and beliefs at all levels are going to make it very hard to make the changes that are needed. So in order to facilitate change, you're recommending building a secondary parallel network of small innovative schools, which would depend on choice being available. So did, did any of that not hit the mark, that it was like close? Yeah, that, that's, that's very much on the mark. Uh, the, the last thing I would modify a little bit, which is to say that uh, I don't believe that the present system is capable of making the kinds of changes that are necessary. If it were, that would be wonderful. So I think the only way we're likely to get them is not by trying to reform the existing schools, but by creating new ones. Now, they could be public schools within a district, and there are some districts that are now stepping out and trying to create different models. And they're talking, they talk about a portfolio of schools. They're still very much in the minority. Uh, and, of course, there are charter schools which, at their best, and if they were ever uh, stayed within the basic and original concept of what they should be, would be doing a great job, but they've been co-opted to a large degree by the system. So a lot of charter schools are just, they're doing it to avoid the unions and to get out of some regulations. Uh, but I think the, the, the seeds are planted. I think that the idea of creating new schools that are very, very different than traditional schools is at least, you know, kind of underway. Uh, and I think that's where our hope has to be because I don't believe you can really change the existing schools sufficiently. You have a quote by uh, Clayton Christensen 
a, a testimonial of the book at the beginning, uh, and then you yeah. quote him quite often, or you quote um, books that he authored or co-authored w within Wasting Minds. I get the sense that that, right. that model of disruption is somewhat essential to your idea of creating this secondary track, which should then be disruptive. Uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, you know what Clay said about disrupting an existing and successful industry, and that and its inability to adapt and change its processes, and even when it, it sees that it's in trouble, it's unable to change. And so, as he points out, a number of the 500 Fortune Fortune 500 companies 20 years ago are no longer in business because they couldn't adapt. And I think that's true of schools. It's kind of interesting that Clay, I first heard of him speak uh, via a remote connection in a, at a meeting in uh, St. Paul, and he was in Cambridge, and he had a question and answer period by video, and, uh, and was asked whether his ideas would really work in a governmental uh, system. Because, you know, he's talking about pre-enterprise and corporations which have a lot more flexibility or more nimble, I think, than government. And he said, I think so, yeah. And, and it was that when he, that was the beginning of when he decided to start thinking about education, which led eventually to disrupting class. It took about two years. And some of the people at Minnesota meeting became, like Kurt Johnson became a co-author. A number of us submitted essays uh, and papers to Clay and had a couple of meetings to talk about, you know, the book. And so he finally produced Disrupting Class, which was designed in part to prove that what his theories about disruptive innovation are equally applicable to a public system like education. One of the ideas I find very compelling in the disruptive innovation model is the difficulty of the core enterprise um, adopting the disruptive innovation, in part because right. you don't know which of the many, many innovations that you're seeing is going to become the disruptive innovation. So it feels like there's an inherent dilemma for the core institution. That presumes that the core institution is actually looking to change. And I, and I get the sense from your book that you feel quite strongly that that's not actually the case. Yeah, and I don't, I'm not sure I would agree with your interpretation of, of that because I think what Clay said is that you have a company like uh, a digital equipment, DEC, which was one of the really big successful computer companies. And when the personal computer came along, it was almost a toy. And the people at DEC said, yeah, we could do that. But, you know, the profit margin on these little toys, the market's probably small and the profit margin is minuscule. And we're producing these huge systems that had 50% pro profit, and they were large. They were going to universities and corporations. Let's not screw around with that. They saw the possibility of that eventually become their competition. And as it, as it emerged, they were unable, even if they'd wanted to, they were unable, they were not agile enough to change their processes, uh, to change the way their people think, and uh, and so they went out of business. I mean, Clay gives the alternative example of Dayton Hudson, uh, which was facing going out of business because they couldn't compete with Walmart and stores like that. So they created a Target. Uh, you know, they created a whole new organization. Now Target runs Dayton Dayton Hudson. So there was a there was a group which at least realized it could not change Dayton Hudson. So it created a new school, if you will. Uh, that could compete and do the job. And so I, I, I think it's that more that. I agree that these organizations really don't want to change. But even if they see that they need to change and, and decide they want to change, they still probably can't because the, the baggage they carry is just too heavy. Well, and as you point out, I think it's not just the baggage. It's the sort of entrenched individual interests at all levels. Yeah. Right. We've been doing it this way for so long, you know, and it works. Well, some, somehow in 1978, you looked out and you said, there's going to be unprecedented ferment and controversy in public education. Can you give the listeners right. a little bit of an idea of uh, uh, 
who you are and, and how you came to that conclusion? Yeah, uh, uh, quite before that, back in the uh, early late 50s and early 60s, a group of old university magazine editors formed a loose group and decided to start collaborating and sharing their resources to produce special reports on higher education, which they bound into their own magazines. And, uh, and suddenly they were reaching millions of educated Americans with messages about higher education. It was so successful, they actually gave foundations some of their grants back. And, uh, and that led to a formal organization, a tax-exempt 501c3, called Editorial Projects in Education. And in 1996 or 66, we launched the Chronicle of Higher Education, which was an instant critical success and shortly afterwards a commercial success, even though it was run by a nonprofit organization. And by the late 70s, the Chronicle was doing very well, and there was always a sense of mission in this group. And they said, what do we do next? And so I left Brown and joined uh, the organization with the specific task of coming up with our next major project. And one of the things on the table was the Chronicle of Lower Education. But we also considered a, a 60 Minutes on Education, the television thing, and we considered a health care, a Chronicle of Health Care. But we settled on a chron the Chronicle of Lower Education, soon to become Education Week, because Ted Sizer and Ernie Boyer and other people were publishing books right about that time in 1980 and uh, 81, and it was very clear that public education was headed for a very, very uh, rough period of turmoil and, and dispute and all the rest of it, and we felt that the people making decisions needed good, objective, comprehensive, unbiased information, and so we started Education Week. Is that... Uh, what you're getting at? It is. And I'm intrigued because, you know, sort of the, the end of that story is uh, uh, retiring and then moving on to um, big picture and feeling like you bring uh, both a deep understanding of sort of traditional thinking about education with the recognition of things that you saw through the Met School that sort of substantially reinvigorated your interest in seeing um, some form of education change? Well, I've become so disillusioned, Steve, over the years. I, I served with the Pew Forum on Standards-Based Reform for 10 years. And uh, some of the smartest, most articulate, committed educators in America, not just educators, politicians, and faculty members. And, and, uh, and with each passing year, I became more and more disenchanted about the way we were going about trying to fix public education. So when I retired, my idea was to come to Rhode Island and write novels and poetry and maybe get involved in something easy like the environment or health care. And I really did not want to continue in education. And then Ted Sizer and Dennis Litke asked me if I'd serve on the board of Big Picture. And I hesitated, and then I thought, oh, hell, it's only going to be one meeting a year or so. And so I joined. Ted left, and I got stuck being chairman. And uh, since then, I've been probably putting in a day of week at, at, and work for them. But they saved my life because they showed me what could really happen if you do it right. Uh, and the philosophy of education that was exemplified by the Met and then by big picture schools that started uh, was the philosophy that, that I think really, really would work. And... You know, I have no doubt in my mind that we can design an educate public education system. Uh, a bunch of us could do it in a, a month. The problem would be, would you, would you ever be able to get it implemented? And because I don't think there's any lack of ideas, I think the evidence is there. I think the proof of concept is there. And if you've got schools that can educate, hard to educate kids, the poor, the minority, the disadvantaged, uh, and do it successfully the way many of these schools like Ed Visions and Big Picture and High Tech High and others are doing, then I don't see how you can justify having any public school that's not succeeding. I mean, it's not a question of not knowing what to do. It's not a question of not, you know, of, of gambling because these, we're showing these things work. 
but but changing the system is just almost almost impossible, probably impossible. So, the, so that's uh, the big picture. Joining big picture brought me back and gave me a whole new perspective on on education, which was much more positive and much more promising. And right now, I'm deeply committed to those ideas. That's the whole second half of the book. Right. So the book is divided into two parts. The first half are the sort of flawed assumptions, and the second half are the, the right. solutions. Um, the assumptions that we would base a really new system correct. on. Correct. Perfect. So Dennis has been on the show. Um, Elliot's about to come on the show. Um, the discouraging piece for me has been watching what appeared to be a fair amount of support for big picture in the last few years uh, seem to dwindle in the face of the accountability narrative. Uh, am I right in thinking that big picture is even well, struggling a little right now? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, I th you know, we've got about 70 schools now. We've got 30 or 40 abroad. Uh, and, and the ones that are, we have in this country, many of them are really outstanding. We're struggling since Gates left us, you know, when they left the small school movement. Financially, we've been struggling a little bit. And, uh, but we're now getting half of our budget from fee for services, where we're providing uh, materials and guidance and so on to, to uh, big picture schools and new big picture schools that are getting started. We train principals and that kind of thing. Uh, so I'd say we're, you know, we're in pretty good health, actually. Uh, and, and I think also that the, there are other, I don't, I don't think that the big picture model is necessarily the only or best model out there. There are a whole bunch of other ways. They all share a set of common, what Dennis calls distinguishers, uh, and they're, they're embodied in my assumptions, and they're things like personalization and performance-based assessment and uh, anchoring education in the real world. Uh, those are, you know, I think those are fundamental to any of the schools that, that I would say are part of the solution rather than the problem. But, but they don't, Ed Visions works differently. As you know, project-based education, uh, they have some courses. We don't have courses. High Tech High, you know, does things differently, but they, they are extremely successful and they fit this general mode. Whereas KIPP, for example, I see is a, a, a traditional school on steroids. Uh, you know, they're doing much the same thing, or they're doing it longer and harder with uniforms, you know, that sort of thing. I'm not demeaning that. I'm just saying I don't consider that a new model of education. That's, I think KIPP and some of those models represent what you'd probably get if you were successful in pushing the existing system to its limit. You know, where it was really doing the best it could, it would be a KIPP system. Uh, and, and nothing you could do with big picture schools or ed vision schools would ever make them look like KIPP or like a traditional system. So uh, again, we're in, uh, having finished the Republican National Convention, now starting the Democratic Convention. Um, are you hearing any voices in the public sphere where you feel like someone is talking about education in a thoughtful way. Um, I'm, I'm struggling to find a voice w within the, the political world that represents the understanding that you bring in the second half of the book. No, I agree. Uh, you know, I think that some of the things that the Obama administration has done in education are promising, but they, like every politician I've heard, have accepted as a given about 80% of what we have out there, and they're trying to fix it by, you know, having a program for innovation and uh, and various, you know, improving teaching and so on like that. And it's my belief, and I don't mean to be negative, but I don't think you can put these kinds of reforms into the existing system. The architecture of the whole system is simply going to prevent any significant progress and take technology that the way schools are organized with the schedule and the curriculum and the grades and all, you know, all of that stuff the way they're organized and the way they operate is totally incompatible in my judgment with with a high technology approach to education and so 
you have very few schools, I think, that are really using uh, technology to its full potential. I'm, I'm talking about traditional public schools. There are some private schools and blended learning schools and charter schools that are that are pushing the limits on how to use their technology. But uh, and so I just I you know I don't I don't I in fact once suggested to a group that what we need in education is what Al Gore is to the environmental movement. This was a couple of years ago when he was attracting a lot of attention, a lot of support, a lot of money. And we sat around talking about who do we know in American politics or even, you know, just a big enough celebrity who would have the clout to pick up the phone and have it answered by the White House. Who do we know? And, you know, we ran out of names in, in about 10 seconds. And the name that was most often mentioned was Colin Powell. Uh, and maybe he could do it. But what we were doing then was what you just said you're doing, was looking for someone out there who has the ideas or at least would accept the ideas and then use all of their influence and so on to put them before the American people. But I, you're right, I don't, I, don't, I don't see a person like that. I haven't seen anybody who's articulating the need for a new kind of education the way some people have been articulating the need for a new kind of energy pro, uh, system or a new kind of environmental system. Uh, public education is always nibbling around the edges. So I'm interested to kind of get to the core of uh, you know, the beliefs or the narratives that, that restructure education. As I read the book, I kept thinking about my grandfather. So I took care of my grandfather in his last years, and he developed pneumonia. And I took him to the hospital. And in the hospital, they gave him an antibiotic, which he was allergic to. And he developed a large ulcer on his leg or his arm. And the next day, the doctors came in, not realizing he'd originally come in for pneumonia. And the whole course of treatment and everything that was being done was related to the ulcer and not the core condition. Now, this may be a little bit of a stretch, but I. But I almost feel as though we've locked ourselves into a whole set of problem solving in education that's actually missing the mark as to what's really going on. How would you describe what the, what the real need is for students and learning? How would I describe what's really needed for students and what, what, what the parents? What the core belief would be for you as to why students go to school and what they should be learning? Um, well, I, I would say that what this this comes to the whole question of personalization. See, I believe one of the things you can say about the medical system when it's working well is that every patient comes in as unique and individual, and the doctor doesn't go out into the waiting room at four o'clock in the afternoon and say, "Everybody sitting here today, you get a shot of penicillin." Uh, every kid who comes to school comes with with a a set of, of unique or personal characteristics of culture, language, family, interests, talents, and so on and so forth. And and it's put into a system which does the same thing to the, all the kids at the same time in the same way. So I would say, first thing is, the system has to have the student at the center. That should be the primary concern of any system which is going to work. It has to start with what do we do for this student? How do we get this student to develop uh, the kind of, of reasoning and problem solving and mentality? How do we get this student to develop the social uh, characteristics they need to exist in a society? All the things, you know, social development and education, how do we do it for this student? And of course, that's the way the Met operates. Each student has his own curriculum, uh, which they work out with their parent, their advisor, uh, and, 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 uh, uh, and then they build it around a, an internship in the community. And so they learn, you know, they're learning out there in the world, and they're learning something they're, they decided they ought to learn, and, it, and they're engaged in it. And to me, you can't, I, I think that's just an essential of, of a new system for, for kids. You know, that's what they need. They need to be treated as individuals. Somebody once said teaching is an act of love. I don't think you can really teach kids if you don't know them, and I don't mean know their names. I mean know them, know what they, what are what are their aspirations, what are their strengths and their weaknesses, where do they, who do they think they are, who do they think they should be and want to be, uh, and teachers don't have time for that. They don't know the kids show up at the schoolhouse door, 
nobody really knows who they are. And, and I'm not talking now about the private prep schools, you know, where the parents send their kids in, in fancy cars and all that. I'm talking about the rank and file. But, you know, the system doesn't work for about 65% of the kids who enter it, and that's a statistical fact. Uh, it, it works reasonably well for the 15 to 25% who know what they want to do, who are going to go on to a graduate school or their father's stock brokerage or, or a law firm or whatever. Uh, and they do all right. You know, they, they may, maybe they do better in a different system, but they do well enough in this system. But, when, but it's the other 65% who uh, just don't, you know, they don't get it. They don't get anything out of it. They get very little out of it. And, and so I think if you're going to start building a system for students, you start with them. They're the ones who are, who are getting in a short, short straw now. And, uh, and the only way you're going to work with those kids is to take them one by one and figure out what to do. That may sound simplistic or idealistic, but as far as I'm concerned, that's where, it's, that's where it has to begin. If you do that, if you say we're going to personalize education, then you automatically have to I mean, it just becomes, it follows naturally. You're going to have to change a lot of other stuff. Standardized tests won't work if, it's, if education is individualized. Uh, you're going to have to re go to something, you know, performance-based assess assessments. Uh, you, you're going to need pathways. You can't have this only one pathway. If you've got individualized education, you're going to have to have a variety of ways that kids can proceed through school. You know, we, we created a system that supposedly serves head smart and hand smart kids, but the system doesn't serve the hand smart kids anymore, and they're a large part of the, the group that drop out. So one of the other things we need to do is, is figure ways to link education to the world these kids are going to enter. When you think, and I'm, I'll, I'll stop in a minute, but when you think that, that from young adulthood until retirement, we spend all of our lives working for a living, uh, and we spend about probably 28 or 30 percent of our hours on the job. And yet, ask yourself what the formal education system does, either K through 12 or 12 through 16, not only not to prepare kids for work, but not even to make them aware of what the requirements are, the culture is, their options are in, in a modern workplace. You know, there's just a complete void. Uh, and so we wind up with 39 million kids or people in the system who started their education and never finished. Uh, and they wind up without a credential, underemployed. Uh, so, you know, there are things, I, I, those are the kinds of things I think the core ideas that would have to be built into a new system. I hope that was responsive. Certainly was. No, it absolutely was. And I want to drill a little bit further even and see how you feel about this. Often I'll hear the words personalization and customization, but they're still uh, directed by the adults. And I, I'm, I'm going to put, I'm going to venture forth with the argument that ultimately, if your goal is to create a self-directed learner, that you have a very different set of conclusions that you draw versus the ultimate goal being some kind of conformance to other people's standards. Is that fair? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I just think those two things are incompatible. I mean, you have to have standards. I don't think anything, anybody would argue you don't have to have standards. But you don't have to have the same standards for all kids, uh, especially when those standards are essentially geared to producing kids who are academically sophisticated and going to go on to college and become, uh, you know, do well in undergraduate education, get a bachelor's degree. The fact is that, that the schools and the colleges seem to be trying to prepare everybody to be a professor or a teacher. Uh, it, it, and, and I just don't think that, you know, that's going to work. So, yes, I agree with what you said. I don't think you dive deeply into this in the book, but there's a little bit of a, there's a line where you talk about the importance to our, our democratic principles of having students who can think and be uh, and reason and and look beyond sort of surface level explanations or emotions. Uh, it feels to me like that's a, a really significant issue, and especially if your goal is to help uh, students develop as self-propelling um, 
sort of lifelong interested in going into depth in subjects. Um, do you personally feel like that the, this issue with democratic governance is a significant one? Absolutely. I, I didn't go into it deeply, uh, and, and I'm, you know, I'm sounding off now. I uh, I can't document everything I say with evidence, but it's certainly been my experience, and I think it's pretty obvious that a large percentage of the population doesn't have either the information or the inclination to make the kinds of informed judgments about their civic life that they're going to have to make if this society is going to continue to function. You know, I think the greatest problem we face right now is not the environment or the climate or energy or education. It's the fact that as a system, we no longer seem able to address crucial issues and problems in a way that allows us to solve them. It's not a question of finding the solution. It's a question of getting people to agree on it and implement it successfully. Uh, you know, I heard on, on an NPR discussion today a former Republican congressman who's written a new book called Polic uh, Parties Versus the People, uh, in which he says that 15 years ago he was voted the most conservative Republican member of the Congress. Uh, today, if he were to go back and vote exactly the same way on exactly the same issues, he would be considered one of the most liberal members of the Republican Party. So the party has moved even farther to the extreme right. Uh, and so you have this, as everybody knows, I'm just saying what is so obvious to everybody, we can't seem to solve any problems. There's the inclination and the interest is, uh, special interests are so great, but if you try to do anything that, that uh, offends or intrudes upon somebody else's special interest, they find a way to either kill it or water it down to the point where it won't work. And so if the, if the democracy, if the republic is going to succeed, we have to figure out a way that we can address problems like global warming or health care or welfare or the budget or the economy or all those things intelligently and, and then have people know enough to be able to make some hard decisions. You know, th th it's really fascinating to, in this political season now to have people saying something out of one side of their mouth, like, we want government out of our lives, and then turning around and saying, we need help with the drought in the Midwest, or you've got to come and help us with the hurricane in New Orleans, or we need subsidies for the, you know, for this or for that. It's as though they don't, you know, they don't understand. They just don't know enough about, about the society and the political system and the way they work. And I think that's an obligation that education has, that when kids leave, they should know how to think and reason. They should be able to evaluate information they get. They should know when they're being scammed. Uh, you know, those kinds of, of skills are far more important to me than, than uh, a lot of knowledge about uh, whatever, you know, the, the ancient history. All of those things, I believe, are wonderful, and I, I was immersed in them, but only after I realized what education was all about. And and basically, it's about opening your mind and developing the kinds of skills you need to evaluate information and make intelligent decisions and, as you say, be a self-directed learner for the rest of your life. So I, I feel very strongly that we have fallen down on our civics uh, obligation, and it's not going to be solved by adding a course in civics. You know, it's just not, that's not what it's all about. In fact, if you, if, if the, if you say the schools should model what they teach, there's nothing in a society probably less democratic than the education system. Uh, you know, it's, it's top down. The kids don't have any, any say. They don't, uh, you know, they're, we had Supreme Court cases because kids chose to wear black armbands in the school and bang. So it's not very democratic, uh, not a very de democratic model that they're passing through. And they have very little opportunity to confront the kinds of realities that they will confront, uh, you know, the legal system, the criminal justice system, uh, the political system, et cetera. So, again, sorry if I ramble. You're not, and we're here to hear you. So there's a discouragingly recursive aspect to this discussion, which is we have an inability to think intelligently about complex issues, which includes policy decisions about education, 
which is the arena in which we would actually overcome that. I'm sorry, you say that <laughs> okay. last thing again. Maybe I've dived off a, too deeply here. It, it feels like there's a, a um, that we're caught in a trap because we're, we have this difficulty of talking intelligently about complex issues at a public level and a private level. Right. We need education to help fix that, but included in that difficulty of talking about complex issues is the issue of education. Absolutely. I, you know, I think that's kind of, I, I use that in a, I try to use that sometimes in a funny way when I'm giving a talk or something. But, you know, the irony of this, to some degree you can say education has produced uh, generations of people who are incapable because of the way they were taught to now make the kinds of changes they need to make in education so that won't happen to their children. Uh, and and I, I really do believe if you ask the average citizen any kind of difficult questions about the school system, uh, that, you know, they just won't be able to respond very well. There again, it's the old thing, you know, everybody's been there, everybody, has, it worked, for, well, it worked for me, it ought to work for all these kids. And even if they, even if they do, are concerned with some specific issues, uh, their level of, of commitment, interest, even outrage is so small. Uh, it, it always strikes me that people will get more upset about the fact that their streets aren't cleared after a snowstorm than they do about 1,200,000 kids who drop out every year. Uh, there is really an imbalance. It's, I, I, you know, I can't understand why parents aren't out in the street with pitchforks sometimes. There, there is, I, I'll just tell you one quick anecdote. Uh, the uh, uh, No Child Left Behind, as you know, said that if schools didn't achieve minimum progress, annual minimum progress, they would be uh, go through a series of stages, one of which would be the parents would be allowed to take their kids out of the school and put them in a better school. So some years ago, the superintendent of schools in Providence sent a letter out, and I got one. It was a letter to the parents, and it said, I'm required by No Child Left Behind to tell you that the X school has been declared, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's not a, 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 not a certified school anymore. You now have the right to take your children out and put them in a better middle school. Next paragraph. Unfortunately, there is no middle school available, which is any better. <laughs> These aren't the exact words, but that was the message. And you know, how could you not just, the absurdity of it, you know, we're going to take the kids out and let them go to a better school. There ain't no better schools. So, yeah. Ron, to, to what on. degree is this part of a larger cultural issue? Some of what we're talking about, I think, here could be my brother does a lot in energy policy. It could be talked about in energy policy. It could be talked about in prison reform or policy. We could talk about it in terms of the financial markets. Is this actually part of right. a larger cultural difficulty we're having uh, in the United States specifically? And and it well, yeah, that's what I meant when I said because it's like these big issues are lined up on a track like boxcars. And, and when they come in for repair, nobody can agree on how to fix them. And so they just push them off on a spur. Uh, all of the big issues and problems we have uh, don't get solved because we don't, the mechanisms that once existed in our political system to bring the elected representatives together to act on behalf of the public and the people who put them there by solving their problems no longer is working. And, and to me, that is a large cultural problem that goes, you know, to every major issue we face. And even when you take something like health care, which everybody would agree was because of its rising costs, was becoming one of the most serious economic problems this society had. Uh, Hillary Clinton tried, as you recall, to get it fixed, and it got shot down. Uh, and Obama finally gets it, and he has enough cachet that he's able to push it through but he has to make some compromises, and there are some problems in it, but it gets passed. And ever since then, we've been trying to repeal it. And you know that if Mitt Romney gets elected, there will be a major effort to repeal Obamacare. And where will we be? Right back where we were before. The health care system is out of control. 
the expenditures are rising at an astronomical rate. It's becoming more and more for the uh, the resources of the society, and it's all you know all wapajamas, and we can't solve it. Not because we don't know how, because we can't agree. If you do this, you're a socialist. Uh, if you do this, you're a bleeding heart liberal. Uh, I'm not saying these problems are easy. You know, the problems of entitlements, for example, which are often talked about, are really difficult issues. But I do believe they can be solved. Uh, but they're not going to be solved until people are really willing to put, the, like I said, put the student in the center, put the public in the center and say, we're not doing this to satisfy the lobbies. We're not doing this to satisfy our party. We're not doing this to get reelected or get a grant. We're doing it because we owe it to our voters and the public to solve this damn problem. It doesn't happen much anymore. It's changed radically, dramatically in my lifetime. Ron, you yeah, don't, I think it is part of the larger culture. You don't use this language, but I kept thinking as I read the book that to a large degree, some of the um, uh, ways in which people are kind of entrenched in protecting their routine or status could be described as entanglements. And does it, it, it feels as though it requires some large percentage of the, um, of the people to be willing to give up something they believe is an entitlement of theirs in order to focus on a larger issue. Some nations have been able right. to do this. You know, Finland. Yes, absolutely. Finland clearly did this with the narrative of equity. We don't do equity in the United States. It's not a narrative. We do opportunity. But are there narratives around entrepreneurship or individuality or um, choice that you feel resonate enough with us as a people to become kind of a guiding path? Wow. I said the last two words, become a, a guy. Oh, sort of the path that we could get on. That, I mean, choice is a, is a word you use a lot in the book. And choice is sort of. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think they're there. But that's, again, part of the problem we were just discussing. I mean, you can look at a, another country, a Scandinavian country, or look at Canada's uh, health care system. And you can say, well, there's a model and it works. It doesn't work perfectly. There are some problems with it. But you could say, let's take the best of it and and do something with it. And of course, it's a path. You know, it's a model worth looking at. Maybe uh, I haven't studied the Finland education system, but now it's a big thing out there. Everybody's saying, look at the way the Finns are doing it. Uh, we always have models and paths that, that look as though they will take us to where we want to go. But it's almost as hard to get people on the path as it is to get them to address the issue. Plus the fact, and I'm sure everybody who's involved in this business has had this experience, you have something that really works. I remember when Tony Alvarez was in District 2 in New York City, and the Met is an example of this, and there are other schools around the country where, man, they really made headlines because they were doing something that worked beautifully. And so for a period of time, they had busloads of people coming from all over the country to see how it worked. Superintendents, schools, principals, teachers, politicians, and they come and they go through and they get the tour and they say, yeah, wow, it really does work. And then they go back home and nothing happens. Uh, and and uh, that is, that's really the pattern. That's not the exception. That's the way it mostly is. And, you know, I remember Howard Gardner's work. Some of the schools that first started doing it, there was a school in Indianapolis called the Key School. They had so many visitors, they had to finally start saying, no, we can't, or you're cutting into our teaching time. People travel, drove, teachers put in their money to drive clear across the country to visit that school. Uh, but if there were three replications of the key school in the country, I miss them. Uh, everybody looks and says, wow, that's great. And then they go back and say, we can't do that here for some reason or other. Ron, I leave in about a week to do, uh, I'm going to call it a multi-city tour, but that's giving it more substance than it actually is. It's um, sort of a form of a family vacation, but I'm going to cities on the east and west coast and holding informal meetings to talk about education, to kind of do what we're doing here, but, but in local arenas. What, if you were giving me advice on, on how to go about that, how would you 
want to envision that kind of an event for people? You know, I'm sorry to say, Steve, but there were a couple points in there where you were breaking up a little bit. You're going off in a week. Right, to, to, and to go to multiple cities to hold conversations like the one we're having tonight, but in local right. venues to talk right. about education. And right. if you were trying to think of a way for those to be as productive as possible to generate a sense of interest in the conversation, would you give me some advice? Oh man, that's really a tough question because you know, and I've done that, not you know, not in in the way you're doing it, but I've gone to I've been invited to go to communities to talk about education like this, wasting minds, and uh, and there are always a few people who really get turned on. You know, and they're the ones who rush up afterwards and want to do something, but the great majority of people, you know, you look out at them and and they're you know they're listening, but this is uh, it's very hard to get them to engage. It's very hard to get them to you know to, to see the conversation and say this is something I can really get something from and I can use. Uh, I, I don't I wouldn't know how to do that. I mean I one of the things that, that I have found useful working with Big Picture is that we we take a couple of students with us uh, and the students always somehow manage to charm the audience. Uh, especially, you know, we, and we make sure the students are really kids who have something to say, and and they are much more successful at getting through and getting a conversation going with people than than we are. Because I don't, well, I don't quite know why, but it's off, it's more authentic, I guess. It's it's happening to them. That's not something that I guess would work for you. I actually think it's uh, I think idea. it's a brilliant idea. I've gotten good advice from Alfie Cohn and Tony Wagner, and I have kind of a plan, but adding the students is actually brilliant, and I'm really glad you brought it up. Hey, we've only got a few minutes left. I want to allow people to ask questions if they have questions. I also am very interested in the story you tell at the very end of your friends sharing the converted barn and, and thoughtful, intelligent friends who just couldn't see your point of view. You're, I think all of us right. face that when we talk to family and friends about education. Um, could, can you kind of use that as a springboard to, to give us a sense of what you hope people would do after listening to you in this session? Uh, yeah, you know that was that was a as I said in the book that was really a, a moving experience, and it gave me the ending for the book because these are two really dear friends who worked together for years, and we go on this annual retreat. And to places so beautiful that we shouldn't be talking about education problems, but I was sketching out for them the ideas of wasting minds, and I expected because it was always that way, you know, that they would nod and, and add positive remarks, but they just backed up and said, "No, you, you, every kid has to take algebra, you know, otherwise you're discriminating against them." And uh, and kids who are 13, 14, 15 years old should not be allowed to make important choices because they're too young. Uh, and it went on like this. And, on, and I was shocked and astonished. Uh, and they, you know, they thought I was gone off the reservation. And, and so I realized if, if I can't, if people who have worked with me for years on Education Week and Teacher Magazine and who are more than just colleagues professionally, they're close personal friends, and if in the relaxed setting of uh, Big Sur, we couldn't agree even on something as you know as fundamental as what we were talking about, then what chance do I possibly have of changing the minds of school board members and superintendents and and people who have unions, people who have a real vested interest in keeping the system, not necessarily keeping the system the way it is, but keeping their place in the system the way it is. Uh, and that was that was. Uh, you know, that was a very useful experience for me. And I, and when I talk about the book, as I've been invited to a number of places to meet with a group of people and to talk about the book, somewhere halfway or three quarters of the way through the discussion, they say, well, how do we do the, how do we get these things to happen? And that's where everything all kind of turns down because I can't answer that question. I can't, you know, I just don't know how to make it happen. 
uh, somehow we, you know, what we're trying to do is change the way Americans think about education in schools. That's a very simple statement, but how do you change the minds of Americans? How do you change the way people look at schools and education, how they think about them? And that's very tough. And that was the lesson of that last chapter. That was a lesson that was retaught to me. And until we figure out a way to solve that problem, all the other stuff in the book is just so much, you know, rhetoric. Um, and and that's I guess that's where I've come out. And I, 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 you asked when you started I, the book, do what I wanted to do and so on. And the answer is that not really. It probably, as you said, spoke to the choir, maybe changed a few minds, but it didn't. It didn't prompt anybody to say, let's get a committee together and change the way we do business. Ron, I wonder if uh, yeah. you used the example of Colin Powell or someone famous who could dial the phone and the White House would yeah. pick up. I almost wonder if we're not actually looking for a Gandhi moment, which is rather than a Gandhi, Gandhi correct. Meaning rather than somebody who energizes those who are already benefiting from the system, that you find a way to energize those who are not. Yeah, that, that, that would be a great accomplishment. That's worth a Nobel Prize. <laughs> okay, Ben wants to... I mean, to some degree, Go ahead. You know, Martin Luther King, in a way, did that because while he was, while he was energizing uh, the African-American people in this country, he was also starting to change the way white people thought about this issue. Uh, and he, and you know, you talk about Gandhi, he was in that same mode as Gandhi. You do have a question from Ben. He wants to know, what countries or even global city school is close to or near to your ideal school system? What country? Country. I don't know of country any country. Or I don't know of any country that whose school system uh, does what I'm talking about. I know that there are some school systems in foreign countries that pay a lot more attention to the students and give the teachers a lot more say. But I think all the ones I'm aware of still have the basic conventions of a core curriculum, a schedule. The architecture of the school remains the same. But by shifting the roles and emphasis to teachers and students, they get better results than we do. And, and, and one, I'm going to make a PS to all that I've said. I think it's still possible to improve the system we have to the point where it's doing much better than it is now. I don't think it will ever be adequate to the needs. But there is still a lot of room in there to improve it. And, and I think that there are some systems in other countries which have taken that step, and so their students are doing better because they they put the student more in the center and they get the teachers more authority, uh, and they did some other things to, to allow the, the system to function better. And I can answer, I think, for you that you would point people toward big picture schools and some of these other schools as well, right, as possible examples of, right. of where it's being done well. Uh, Ron, as a courtesy chart, go ahead. Uh, and, uh, well, I was just going to say, it's really, it's really gratifying. We have a bunch of Hollanders come over here. I think there are 15 or 20 schools in Holland, big picture schools. And they come over here once a year for a couple of days to refresh and train new people. And they are really getting everything out of this, this kind of, this model of school. I mean, they are really excited about it. If they had their way, there would be school like this in every community, and that's you know, that's really gratifying. I guess it's you know when when your the people who are following you are more passionate and more avid than you were, it it makes you feel good in a way. Ron, uh, thanks for coming on. As a courtesy, we do end on time, and you've been generous in giving us an hour of your time, and I really appreciate it. I'm using the applause icon, which is underneath the smiley face for those of you who can find that in the participant window. I know it is hard to find. But Ron, thank you so much for the book and for being here tonight. Well, thank you, Steve, and thank the people who uh, listened in. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to Ron. The book is Wasting Minds. Okay. What our education system Bye -bye. is failing and what we can do about it. Take care, Ron. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody, for coming. 
very interesting. Can't wait to keep these conversations going. Lexington, Kentucky is not on my list, but I'm willing to consider it. I'm going to post tomorrow on my blog uh, what the cities are and the dates and try and get people's feedback. I'm, I'm willing to meet in a living room, a library, a classroom. I just want to start holding these conversations and find out what helps people become interested in having the conversation. Okay, we're going to wrap up. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Have a good night.